in a minute. Okay, hello everyone. So um, welcome to the Exprag Wine Gatherings. We're in Brussels today uh, with Mikael Kissin, and thanks to him, we have a very special drink menu. So it's uh, beer or vodka or both in one glass even. Um, and that's also why I thought the party lights are appropriate for today. So, um, like I just said, the session will be recorded um, and then we'll post it on our website. Um, as always, please type your questions into the chat after the talk. And we want to encourage um, especially junior researchers to ask questions. So if you put a JR before your uh, question, if you're a junior researcher, then we'll prioritize it. And uh, the first, junior researcher who asks a question will also get a drink at the next physical expert conference. Does it have to be vodka with beer? Or? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see that. <laughs> um, and also, if you uh, prefer that we read the question for you, then you can make a note, for example, put read at the end of the question. So then we read it for you. If you don't put that, um, we'll ask you to uh, ask the question yourself. Um, so I'll hand it over to Ira now, uh, who will introduce our speaker for today. Great. Uh, so today we have the honor of having uh, Mikael Kiesen. Uh, give our give the Exprag wine, beer, vodka talk. Um, Mikael, um, you know, has an interesting uh, life story. He was actually born in uh, in Leningrad, and at ten moved uh, directly to um, to Belgium, and um, and then pretty much stayed there except for a two year stint uh, at Cambridge, right? So he um, he's one of the rare people who managed to uh, be a, in the same, more or less the same university, uh, his most most of his professional life, um, and then to get jobs there. And so um, now he is an associate professor of linguistics at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Um, and by the way, it's uh, it was just his birthday. Uh, also, um, yeah, so now he heads this really uh, impressive group, a, a large group of uh, um, postdocs, doctoral students um, that is focused largely on autism, though he told me he has a couple of uh, students who do things other than that. So it's not focused only on autism. Uh, the group's called the Autism, autism Context Theory and Experiment. And, um, and also, some of you might be aware that he's got, um, there's a perspectives uh, section of language that is going to come out uh, where he's, it's kind of a, um, you know, BBS style where he has a target article and people are, are uh, responding. So many of you out there might, you know, be working on that right now because it's due tomorrow. Um, and um, so today he's not going to talk so much about what's in that perspectives article. I don't think it's going to be more general. And so um, let me hand it off to Mikel. Thank you very much, Ira, and um, um, thank you for having me. I'm really honored and uh, humbled, especially because I'm a kind of late comer to to the ex Prague. I wasn't there from the beginning, even though I mean I must. I know many, many of uh, the early ex um are really old and dear friends. And, um, and so those of you who know me know how much I would like to share this beer for real with you. Um, and so um, my talk today would be, um, you know, a bit like, can you see this? Sorry. Uh, yeah, can I, I, I just want to share my screen first. Uh, let me make you... Uh... Uh, no, that's gonna be, that works, right? Yeah. 
So yeah, what I thought is basically my, my talk would have a, a form what, what would go on in a bar, in a pub. So we'd start talking about serious stuff about data and then, you know, slowly slipping to more theoretical and more speculative um, ideas. So this is what I'm, I'll try to do today. I'll present some of the data, uh, some of, uh, of, of, of experiments, some new, some older, on, mostly on autism. And then I'll just float some ideas. They're not really revolutionary, but I really look forward to see what you think about that. Perhaps you'll just think that they are stupid, but that's possible. So, um, but mostly I will talk about autism, just as a reminder, um, uh, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder um, with a prevalence like varying between one kid over uh, 100. Some, some estimates are even higher. And it's, it's characterized by a combination of um, stereotypical and repetitive behavior, uh, restricted repertoire of interest. And, and this is what, um, what's most interesting for us as um, students of language and of pragmatics, really mark difficulties in verbal and nonverbal interaction and language. Now, there is really a great uh, heterogeneity and it's really, really important to, to acknowledge that and to think about that when we approach autism. And, but today I'll, I'll focus on really highly verbal end of the spectrum, even though I, um, I think it's really important to, 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 to study minimally nonverbal children. And this is actually what I'm mostly preoccupied with these days. But so today's talk uh, is on people whose uh, verbal uh, levels are in the typical range of whose um, nonverbal IQs are in the typical range or even above sometimes. But even these people have really marked and lifelong and persistent difficulties in the use of language, in management of conversation. And also, and this is a really, uh, this is among the diagnostic criteria for this uh, uh, part of the spectrum, they are said and it is attested that they have marked difficulties in the pragmatic side of the language and the comprehension side. They have difficulties or reported they have difficulties in uh, understanding metaphors, irony, jokes, ambiguity, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is really something that in the diagnostic uh, manual of uh, in the DSM-5, it's, 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 it's taught in, in, in classes, it's all over in handbooks. Now, those of you who heard about recent research on uh, pragmatics in autism might have heard that the picture is actually not that uh, monolithic, say, let's say. So um, now I'll, I'll survey some of the research showing that uh, pragmatics in, uh, in autism is, the, the pragmatic impairment in autism is subtler than just lack of uh, non understanding of non-literal language. And, they'll, um, and, and I'll discuss some paper in a really short way and some uh, at more length. And, um, and then I'll, I'll just ask what does that tell us about or suggest about the way we should approach pragmatics in general. Now, a very first example, which is probably the most well-known about how things are subtle uh, about pragmatic synotis is metaphor. So metaphor comprehension may be seen as impaired, but um, it has been co rather consistently shown not to be predicted by autism symptom or autism severity or that's important theory of mind. What's, what predicts metaphor comprehension really is lexical knowledge. And um, another aspect which is kind of interesting um, about metaphor in autism is, and, and it's, it's an experience you have when you interact with, with, with autistic uh, children, verbal autistic children and adults actually, is that they, some of them use really idiosyncratic and vivid metaphors, but which are sometimes 
difficult to understand because this is their metaphorical interpretation. So one take on metaphor and notice in which I think it's kind of plausible is that the metaphorical processing, both in comprehension and in production is not impaired per se, but it's just that metaphor comprehension and production is not guided by assumptions about interlocutors' uh, perspectives. Um, the same kind of finding emerges from um, research on scalar and, or quantity inference and scalar implicature in autism. So there are a lot of several papers um, and uh, which, which showed in, independently and the first two uh, papers came out more or less at the same time. And I think they, they were completely independent. One is by uh, Judith Peñacar team and one was by Coralie Chevalier, uh, Didier Wilson, Francesca Ape and Ira. And, and then this finding has been replicated. Basically, the finding is that um, autistic um, adults and teenagers um, derive quantity implicatures to the same extent uh, as neurotypical controls. However, and this is not something I'll, I'll get into um, in detail, but during the discussion, we can get into detail if you want. It also looks like so that in more complex cases, which generally require reasoning about speaker beliefs, where you cannot get out just by reasoning about, about alternatives, there the performance starts to diverge. And there it looks like either autistic uh, uh, participants have more difficulties or they just adopt a rather automatic um, derivation. Another study that um, uh, has been run by um, uh, a former uh, PhD student of mine, Ekaterina Ostashenko, it's, it's really nice study. She looked at um, selective trust in autism, how uh, autistic, and this, this was on children, how autistic kids uh, take into account the epistemic status of people when they have to decide whose information they will trust to learn the meaning of an new word. And in one condition, you had two participants and one participant was mistaken about the meaning of really familiar words. So one of the, of the participants will be mistaken about what is a fork. And what Ekaterina found is that autistic and typical developing kids would not trust that speaker um, for, for determining the meaning of a new word. And this was uh, true on the behavioral level, but also on the eye tracking level. However, in the second condition, things were a bit subtler. Here you had both speakers were correct in determining the meaning of known words or familiar words, but one of the speakers needed help. So one of the speakers needed help to decide what a fork is, say. And here, what Katrina found is that typically a developing kid would not trust that speaker. They, they would disregard information coming from that speaker. However, autistic kids, they would learn indiscriminately information from that speaker or from a completely reliable speaker. So without getting too much in the, into the details, what, what you have here again, I think is indication that in autism you have some kind of surface mechanism to monitor a context and speakers contributions, but this mechanism doesn't generally, generally include information about epistemic states, about what is the epistemic state of the speaker? What is the strength of her beliefs? And the same kind of picture emerges from a, a nice study which was designed by Bon Van Til, uh, who was at the time um, a postdoc in, in my group um, on strategic deception. So here basically, uh, I'm, I'm showing only one condition. So basically here what happened is that um, participant had to play a game. Uh, and in that game, they had to reach the treasure and the treasure is a gray square before the opponent. And the participants were the red, uh, the red um, dot and the opponent was the green dot. Now the crucial feature of this experiment is that the opponent cannot see the, uh, 
participant. And you have to get to the treasure as fast as you can and before the, your opponent, so before the red dot. And there was a further complication. You had this tile with arrows. Once you get into the, in, on this tile, you have to go in the same direction. You cannot go back. So basically, if you look at the uh, middle square, which is the deception condition, if you want to get to the square before the green dot, you have to mislead your opponent by moving in another direction, okay? So you have to deceive your opponent. You have to pretend that you're not going straight to the, to the square because otherwise the opponent goes in right to the same square. In here, the findings were really interesting because what happens is that autistic adults learn to engage in strategic deception. They would pretend to go in another direction to trap their opponent and then get to the treasure, but they took more time to do this than neurotypical participant. And once they did it, they started to do it even in conditions in trials where you didn't necessarily have to deceive. So again, what, what the, this, to sum up here, what, what looks like from this, what the indication of this experiment is that, again, they can engage in a rather complex pragmatic behavior, deception, but without spontaneously taking the perspective of their opponent. This is what, what neurotypicals do. Now, to get a bit further, to, to, to deeper in, this, um, in these issues, um, I'd like to look in more details on two conflicting findings um, uh, uh, on pragmatics in autism. And um, this is, uh, this, these are the studies about, uh, on irony. So one really nice, interesting paper, which uh, was also uh, a study which, which was also authored by Coralie and Ira and, and, and Francesca and, and, and Didri, had a really surprising result. So basically what, um, what uh, Coralie and, and, and her colleagues found is that it looked like that irony detection is preserved in, in, in autism. Now that's really surprising because uh, you know irony is a really complex behavior, and it is actually really often attested. And I'll get back to this a bit later that autistic adults have struggled a lot with irony. So, but it's it's important to stress that in that experiment, um, ironic uh, uh, items were singled out by salient intonation. So basically, you had a context of Glentel's field that he decided to come by plane rather by train, train, and then Ben says, and then you had, if it, it was irony, you had a really distinctive uh, uh, intonation. So how clever of you, or something like that. And then you had a forced choice between two items, and it it looked like that uh, autistic uh, participant quite successfully understood when uh, the, uh, the prosodic contour marked irony, right? So does this mean that um, autistic adults understand irony? I think it means that they can detect irony. And um, actually uh, it's not that surprising because most of the adults uh, who are on the spectrum who, and who have an official diagnosis they, 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 they struggle with irony because it's one of the obstacles in, in, in to, to have a you know, neurotypical social life. And in many intervention and therapies and um, you know, health programs and support groups, they thought, about, uh, they thought about irony. So they thought about the fact that sometimes people say things they don't mean and how would you recognize this? Well, you recognize it's either by intonation or because it's something that really, it's obviously not true, right? And this is literally what, how it's, it's thought. So in a way, it's not that surprising that, well, it is, it is an important result, but it, 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 it not that, it's not that surprising that they managed uh, to, perf to, 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 to perform quite well in this task. 
However, that doesn't really mean that you this suffices, this, that, that's sufficient to, um, to understand irony in real life. In real life, you really have to, to it's not the, 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 the irony and so superficial signs are not uh, that reliable, they're not constant. People sometimes do deadpan irony, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And here, what we did, we, we, we designed a task where it's, it's inspired by um, a task by Pexman and colleagues. It's an act out task. So basically the task was, you had to decide or based on, on, on one of the actor's utterance, what the actor would like to drink in this item or what he would like to have uh, between two different items. And sometimes the utterances was, would look like this. So these, in this case, he has a distinctly, distinctively ironic uh, intonation and uh, uh, ironic facial expression. But what we did, we really counterbalanced uh, different items, literal or ironic. Sometimes you had a context, so you knew whether the speaker's stated preference is congruent or not with his actual preferences. So in this case, for instance, you knew beforehand that he doesn't like tea, but he likes milk, say. Sometimes you had um, marked intonation, ironic or not ironic, and sometimes you had completely flat intonation, and the same with facial expression. That was actually tricky because we really needed professional actors because it's, it's difficult to dissociate intonation and facial expression. And facial expression. Now, here, in this task, uh, autistic participant, as you can see here, uh, performed uh, below chance level. So re they really struggled with ironic uh, items. And when you looked at the effect of prosody, so intonation or facial expression, that didn't help at all. The only thing that really helped, well, no, not really, but that contributed to improving accuracy in the autistic group was when the incongruence with speaker's preferences, that, that would improve uh, accuracy. So when clearly there was a mismatch between the stated preferences and accuracy. So um, this means basically that even though autistic adults, um, verbal autistic individuals can detect irony, they're not that good at grasping irony. And this is where I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll, I'll, I'd like to talk about neurotypicals too. And really by asking, um, you know, how we should interpret these data. So what I think a pretty much controversial result by now is that highly verbal autistic Individuals can interpret language in a context dependent way, but they mainly only mostly do this from an egocentric perspective. They cannot take information about speakers' perspectives into account in deriving their interpretation. That I think is by now pretty much uncontroversial. But so how we sh should we think about this? It, does this mean that pragmatic processing is deficient? Or, and this, that, that's another way to think about it, which actually was first suggested by Didier Wilson, at least to me in, in a conference. Does it, only, does it mean that rather that in autism, pragmatic processing is just limited in resources? And to, to explain more what I mean by this, I'd like just to, 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 to present uh, results from a couple of studies on neurotypicals, also on irony. So uh, in another paper on neurotypicals, we took exactly the same stimuli I showed you in this act up task, but um, first we, in one group, uh, it was an online uh, experiment uh, with a lot of participants, we stripped the video, we just extracted the, the, the audio and we asked people to mark, to rate the how ironic it is on the Likert scale. And for another group, and it's the leftmost uh, uh, figure here, uh, we did the same thing with facial expression. We just presented them with facial expression with no audio and they had to rate how ironic uh, it was. 
And you can see, I mean, people are not perfectly good at this, but they're kind of consist consistent at discriminating ironic prosody or ironic facial expression from the rest. Not perfectly good, but there, there is some overlap, but they're kind of good. But now look what happens when you look at in, in details um, at the result of the actual task. So the same task I presented before, you have this, this video, you have to decide uh, what the actor wants. So it's, it's, these are the summary of, of uh, multi-level logistic uh, regression for um, accuracy and linear regressions for, for reaction times. But what's important when, here is when you look at accuracy, intonation has no um, effect. It doesn't improve accuracy. And facial expression actually decreases accuracy. When you have items with distinctive facial expression, then your, your, your accuracy on ironic items is likely to be lower. But what's interesting is what, what, when, what happens when you look at the reaction times. There, what happens is reaction times decrease drastically when you have prosody or facial, facial expression. So basically what it means is that people are less accurate when there is a distinctive ironic intonation or distinctive facial expression, but they are really faster at making the decision. So basically what it suggests is that when there is a salient cue, such as intonation or, or facial expression, participants tend to jump on it and to make the decision really fast. Even though in an act out task, this kind of cue are much less reliable than a just a discrimination task. So people are kind of good at discriminating between ironic and non-ironic intonation or between ironic and non-ironic facial uh, expression, but not in a real act out task. And this is, and I won't, I won't go into the detail here, but this is kind of congruent with, um, with, uh, results uh, from another paper uh, we, we did. And there the task was basically to judge, it, it, it was a third person observation task. So you had to judge whether uh, the hero of utterance would interpret it as, um, as ironic or not. And basically the results there were that taking somebody else's perspectives is cognitively costly and it takes time and it decreases accuracy and you're less accurate if you don't have time to do this. But also what happens is that when there is ironic intonation, people don't engage in perspective taking. They just base their, their responses on ironic intonation. So it's again a parallel, uh, a parallel um, result. So you have different strategies at your dis disposal for instance, to interpret irony. And one is to really engage in perspective taking. Another is to base your interpretation on a surface cue. And what people tend to do in certain circumstances is to base their judgments on this surface cue, even though it, it's actually not that reliable. And this is a case of something that is called in social psychology, uh, cognitive, metacognitive myopia. So you have bad judgment about your own cognitive processes really. And to drive this point home, I, I, you know, I'd like you to think about two ways you can miss irony. You know, one is you just understand, you don't understand that somebody is being ironic. So you just don't have the right pragmatic goal. But sometimes, and all of us experience this, you know that the guy is, is being ironic, but you don't understand what he means. So there you have the right goal, but you just have, you don't have the right processing. And it's exactly, it's actually, this is the a textbook case of metacognitive processing. Think about failing an exam, say a history exam. First case, scenario, you thought that you just had to give uh, an indication of what you think about French Revolution, but what, what you actually had to do is to remember the uh, dates of the main stages, say, 
So, and you failed the exam because you didn't have the right goal, actually. Another way to fail the exam, you know what you have to do, but you don't remember the right? So you have the right goal, not the correct processing. And so basically, I think that this warrants the conception of pragmatic, pragmatics as a metacognitive process. So rather than thinking of pragmatics, and this is where I get really theoretical, and this is the last slide, so don't worry. Rather than thinking uh, about pragmatic as a process we have to find between an utterance and any type of interpretation, say uh, an utterance and an implicature or uh, irony or metaphor, where we should think of it in different terms. There is a context-based selection of levels of interpretation, what you need, where you think you need to get. And this differs from context, from perhaps from developmental stages to developmental stages, etc. And then you have the processing to get to this goal. And to get to this goal, you need to select the resources that you need. And sometimes you need uh, really uh, rich resources. Sometimes you need information about speakers' mental state. Sometimes you wouldn't. And what pragmatic is, the, this process is monitoring this uh, interpretation. And this is actually the definition of what a metacognitive process is. And by metacognitive process, I mean the control of your own, of, of the ongoing metacognitive processing. I don't mean a meta-representation process. So it's not because you call something a metacognitive loop or process that you claim that it is something that meta, that it, it requires a meta-representational level. And there are many arguments in the literature of metacognition for that, mainly because you find that in some animals, etc., uh, etc. Et and I think that it's, 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 it's kind of trivial, actually, what, what, what this slide says, and it's really close to what a lot of people are doing right now, I think. But anyway, this is what I wanted to tell you today. I really um, want to thank you. I want to thank my team and people who are not anymore in my team, but who be, who've been involved in the paper I cited. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you, Michael. So let us know if you have a question through chat. So I decided now the drink tickets for the junior researchers are free choice. So any drink you want. We have a question from my friend Diana. Hi, hi, hello, Mikhail. Um, I had a question about uh, your last slide. So I was wondering, uh, um, within your framework, uh, what drives the context-based uh, selection of the resources uh, that you need to get to the goal? So what drives the selection of different levels of sophistication in this interpretation process? Uh, hi, Diana. Uh, what, one, one obvious answer is the repertoire that you have at your disposal. I think what happens in autism, for instance, is that there is, for whatever reason, a deficit in using information from uh, other perspectives. But sometimes it's because a lot of, uh, some, sometimes it's because to reach the goal you need, you don't need rich resources. So basically cost uh, considerations. So for instance, when your task is to understand whether someone is ironic or not, period. Well, if you have a surface queue, you think you can trust, you just do it this. You won't delve into 
you know what the speaker means, what the context is. But sometimes you you need to get really deep, right? And also, I think, uh, but a lot of people disagree with would disagree on that. But I think that uh, from a developmental point of view, you start from a relatively relatively egocentric uh, point of view. So you you you, you, you wouldn't use other people's perspectives. Um, but uh, I, I think it, it, um, basically what relevance theory uh, brought to the world is this, is basically it's, it's just another way to, to put this in other terms. Thank you. So there's a... There was a private question by Valentina. So for some reason, I, 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 I'm starting to see questions come up. Uh, yeah, so now the general questions come up as well. But so Valentina, Mabini had a question first. Yes, hi, uh, Michael. Thanks for, for your talk. Uh, my, um, my question is about your final proposal of pragmatics as metacognitive control. Um, I, I'm wondering how general you think this account is. Because for instance, if you test uh, patients uh, with schizophrenia, patients with other mental illnesses, which by the way, are related to uh, autism somehow, you also find evidence of a relationship between pragmatic abilities and metacognitive abilities, executive functions, control, attention, et cetera. So my fear is that your account uh, runs the risk of being a slippery slope because in the end there is no pragmatic language disorder as such and pragmatic problems are always a side effect, a consequence of a problem in metacognition, meta, metacognitive control uh, or uh, uh, executive function or other, other cognitive domains which are supposed to be more, more basic. So I'm wondering uh, uh, how general you think this account can, can be. Hi, Valentina. Um, yeah, I don't know how general it, it, it would be and I wouldn't certainly call it an account at this stage, hmm. but one slope I would be really willing to go is the slippery slope towards the absence of pragmatic language disorder, because I don't think that, I, I, I mean, again, this is my position, but I don't think there is such a thing, because I don't think there is such a thing as pragmatics per se. I don't think there is something we can find and say, okay, this is, uh, this is pragmatic. We, we can find a dissociation, really. And I think that, uh, at least my experience, Sorry? Maybe. So, sorry? Well, that's the case of autism. I, I don't know about autism, but in other populations, uh, you can have a pragmatic disorder without uh, a measure deficit in other cognitive domain. Okay, I would... It's an empirical question, but, but as far as... So for instance, a revealing... A revealing uh, uh, fact is that, so, 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 so the slide I showed from, from the DSM is actually the diagnostic criteria for the semantic uh, communicative, sem the pragmatic, soci social pragmatic communicative disorder, which in combination with restrictive, uh, restrictive interest leads to a diagnosis of autism. But it is a separate diagnostic, nosological diagnostic uh, category in the mm -hmm. DSM. The problem is that uh, there, is nice, there is a nice paper by uh, Courtney Norbury actually about that, that no one finds cases like that, pure cases. So people who would have a pragmatic disorder. So yeah, but, but, but I guess you, you, you pinpoint a really important area of disagreement here, but uh, an interesting, interesting one. Thanks. So there are a couple of junior uh, questions. Um, that will be uh, from Josie Bowerman first. Hi, 
Mikhail. Um, thank you for such an interesting talk. Really, really fascinating. Lots to think about. Um, I don't necessarily know if this question is along the right lines, just something that occurred to me from what you said at the beginning about, um, you know, some of the very characteristic um, aspects of autistic spectrum disorders, stereotypical and repetitive behaviour, and these sort of restricted, almost obsessive interests. It made me wonder whether in individuals with autism, there might be some differences in their foci of attention. And if so, whether that might feed into um, some of the troubles that you were sort of highlighting with you know, going things going wrong in processing, like the kind of resources that they're drawing on to achieve their goal. If foci of attention are different, it might be that the the relevant resources to draw upon are just that bit harder to access, um, and therefore that makes them less likely to be drawn upon because it is difficult to attend to them in the first place. Is that something that might be? Yeah, thank th thank you very much. It's 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 a really interesting question. And you, you may, it's, it's something that uh, actually when, when you go, if you look at the blogs, for instance, by autistic people, some of them say that, that one of the sorts of, sort of difficulties they experience in conversation is that because they don't understand why people are doing small talk, for instance, or they're not really interested, so they, they can't invest resources in, in, in processing what, what's being said. So, that, that I think uh, is, is an important aspect. It's not the whole story though, because you find difficulties in adopting um, other people perspectives, even though they are, they're really trying to perform the task. It's not a question only of motivation. Uh, so for instance, I can show you the, uh, I, I think I have a slide here. Yeah. This slide is from, um, from a study by um, a former, a PhD student of mine, Philippine, and she analyzed really in detail the way they tell a story, a narrative. Um, and what you can see basically is that autistic um, adults that are in blue here, they produce much uh, lesser um, extent to different discourse structuring devices, so connected cohesion uh, uh, devices, and also much less in accurate referential expression. So basically, which allow you to you know, to, 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 to follow the, the, the narrative line. Mikhail, Mikhail, just so you know, we're, we're not seeing any slides. Ah, yes, yeah, so so I, I should have, I should have, uh, but yeah, anyway, that, that's, that's the story. Um, okay, great. okay, thank you so much. Okay, we have uh, uh, the next question is from uh, Momita Bomik. Hello. I think we missed one, but okay, we'll do that afterwards. Okay, sorry. Hello. Hi. Can You're you hear wrong. me? Yes. Okay. So uh, this particular question is, uh, it's maybe related to your slides or maybe a bit drifted away, but I thought this is the perfect right time that I asked this question already because I am having this kind of problem with particular portion of this relevance theory and Actually, I'm checking the effect of context extension in children. And I'm pretty much confused whether we can include the speaker's epistemic state and the volitional state within the domain of context itself. So could you answer like to me, is it possible? Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for the, your question. So you should know that I'm, not the best people, the best person in this virtual room to to answer about relevance theories and the specifics of the of the of the um, of the relevance theory. But what I mean by um, um, other people' uh, mental states and including them in the context, what I mean is just including the information you may build. Uh, about other people, uh, the beliefs or assumptions you may draw about other people' uh, mental states or simply perspectives. So you don't need to get as deep as mental states, actually, I think. Um, but also, the, uh, 
major difference between, I guess, standard relevance theory uh, um, um, and, and the account I'm advocating is that I don't think that you always have an attribution that pragmatics and utterance interpretation always, in, always involves the attribution of complex communicative intentions. I think this is a special case, actually. But that's a, a, another story. But um, Okay. So we had one question from uh, Asya Ashimova. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I have a question about the processing account that you seem to be um, advocating. Um, that what you summarized at the end of, of your slides, you said that it's probably the processing resources that uh, individuals with autism that are lacking when they process statements with sentences with irony and not, it's not that something is, is entirely broken, but they don't have enough time or enough processing resources to do this. Uh, would you think that it means that there is, there is a way to force neurotypical adults into the same behavior if we put them under, under some kind of cognitive pressure, like, for example, in, you know, the experiments from KSAR when they, people had to move objects in the grid world and they were in the pressure and then they became more egocentrically. So do you think that we could create situations when neurotypical adults would behave more like autistic adults? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the, in the, the general pragmatics paper I cited at the end, this is basically what we did. Mm. And basically, when you put people on the, on the pressure, they, they would run for the fastest and most frugal response. And I mean, it, it also makes sense in a com completely intuitive way. I mean, we all have been in a situation where we don't understand irony because we're stressed or tired you know if you are doing really something really important and some some somebody starts doing sarcasm it really gets on your nerves and <laughs> that's because it's not the right time to to spend cognitive effort <laughs> so that, that that being said that I, I i should also clarify i think that in real life autistic people have also trouble identifying that somebody is ironic if there is no uh, kind of really big flag uh I see. It's not only only the, the resources. It's it's also sometimes just the very goal of it. Perhaps for for for, for the focal attentional reasons that have been mentioned before. I see. Thank you. Um, so I've got one private question from Greta Matsajo. Uh, Greta, should I read it for you, or would you like to ask it yourself? No, I can ask. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you so much. The talk was really interesting. Um, but there's something that is still not clear to me. Um, okay, uh, autistic people in the spectrum are well known for having theory of mind deficits, but also executive function deficits, sometimes linguistic deficits. So uh, still we have those results that show that there are preserved pragmatic abilities like the results you show this evening to us, even if, uh, yeah, sometimes they are more on adults. When we look at children, there are more mixed uh, results. So which kind of, of processing you predict that might help uh, those adults in reaching the pragmatic goal you mentioned? So what's going on if we have fear of mind deficit, executive function deficit? So what's happening that help them in reaching the diplomatic goal. Okay, th thanks a lot. So uh, two things, I actually, I um, when I first started working on autism from a really theoretical point of view, I, I really believe that uh, a lot of, of things could be explained by executive functions, including theory of mind. Yeah, you know, I really thought that, you know, it would give a unified account. But when you look at the literature, you don't have, it's not that consistent. And I must tell you that we've been like in all study, almost all studies we've run like for five, five, uh, five six past years, we've looked at executive function and nothing uh, comes out. So that's a word of caution, right? Also because it's sometimes tricky to, to, to measure and you know, flexibility dimension is difficult, difficult to tear apart from inhibition, etc. That being said, we, I haven't shown these results, but uh, 
we have also papers, for instance, on, on indirect speech acts, and uh, even young kids uh, manage to do that. So it's not only verbal adults. Uh, so what we can do, I think that there is not, language is really important. The language levels are crucially important. It allows you, the more, the, the richer, the more flexible your vocabulary is, the better your repertoire of, of, of interpretation will be. For the most sophisticated users of, of language, I think the best thing is to know about it when you interact with, with autistic people and try to understand how they function and what they find funny and, uh, and avoid some kind of you know, dry sarcasm you'd be doing otherwise, but much in the same way you do actually, you know, if you talk to people from outside of your social group, you would be more cautious about this. But yeah, I don't think there is uh, a training. I'm, I'm again, it's my personal opinion. I'm not that enthusiastic about programs, uh, about training or about or theory of mind. I'm not sure that this kind of would bring tremendous results, but to me, the most important thing is to improve a structural language. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Greta. There's a, we have a question from uh, Nicolas Petit. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. It's exactly the, the topic on, we, on which I'm, I'm, I'm working. Um, I had a question about these um, good results that uh, autistic participants often have in, uh, in the task that we, that we propose to, to study pragmatic comprehension. And I, I was wondering uh, whether, according to you, one explanation of that would be that um, it's because we miss, we miss something in our task that, that happens in real life and that we don't um, succeed in grasping in, in the task because it's also, it's also a, an intuition I have as a speech language therapist because I, I see many autistic individuals and um, they often have uh, obvious difficulties to access uh, communicate, communicative intention, intentions or uh, implicit meanings, but it's not, it's not so rare that when I test them, they have normal results. So something is not, there's a mismatch something. And I was wondering whether um, it, could, it could also explain um, these results in the, in the papers. Look, I'd be really interested in, in, in knowing more about this kind of data. Um, uh, and I can't really answer because I don't know your task, etc. cetera. Mm. Uh, but um, so a couple of things. First, there is a well-known trend that there is a nice, uh, nice paper by Motron and, and colleagues in uh, molecular psychiatry, I think. Basically, there is a trend of effect sizes uh, shrinking across the years in autism studies. And that because our definitions of autism become broader. And so mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's something that, it, it's something we, you know, we don't often talk about, but if you conduct research on autism, it's something we should be aware of. The other thing is that, yeah, you may have, you may, if, if the task is a forced choice, as more standardized tasks are, you may, depending again, depending on the task, depending on the items, etc., you may have an artificial uh, uh, performance because they kind of they base their decision on compensatory strategy to find the right answer. Actually, there is also a, a well-known issue is that for some kids, autistic kids the standardized Peabody test, vocabulary test, where you have forced choice, um, represent a peak of performance and it's kind of artificial. It's, it's, it's an issue that, that, kind of, that is around here. So, sometimes you cannot administer it. So, it's, it's... so yeah, uh, I think that if you really want to test something, I wouldn't trust just one standardized uh, test. And I'm not saying that they are not useful, they are really useful metrics, 
But if you really want to, to know about the process, then I'll, yeah, uh, I think it's important to try to privilege act out tasks and to see how performance can be uh, subject to different constraints really. But yeah, if, if you, you know, if you want to talk about this, you're welcome to. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next question is from Angelica Anderson. Hello? Uh, uh, it's actually a kind of simple question. I got a little confused when you were talking about uh, meta representation and metacognitive in specific case of autism. Could you? Clarify a little bit for me. It's not. Uh, it's not very clear for me. Yeah. So this is not my distinction. It's 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 a, a, a distinction that has been around for a while. Meta representation requires that you represent uh, in the specific cases of mental states that that you meta represent your state uh, mental states or mental states of other people. Meta cognitive process controls, it's, it's a loop that controls and adjusts the process by which you reach certain goals. For instance, I'm trying to answer your question now and that involves a goal. So I kind of know where, where I, I want to get at. And there is a whole process of drawing the relevant information and answering it in the process that monitors and adjusts this process, this is what's called metacognitive, what people call and what I call a metacognitive process. So basically it's being able to uh, get a sense about the performance of the task at hand or of, of the success of your task. This is how you would measure metacognition. And that doesn't involve a conscious meta representation of the mental states that unfold or I suppose it be unfold at that time. Yeah. So I have one final um, question from um, Jacek Manko. Yeah, yeah, very nice to be with you, um, although virtually. Anyway, um, if I'd like to share my general comment about um, the way um, people with um, autism uh, process irony is, uh, I mean, to my understanding, people with um, on the spectrum are genuinely uh, very truthful and very honest and just they, they stick to patterns and, and predictable rules. And because of that, they just don't like to, they don't like lying or deception. I mean, they can learn to it as you, as you show with a, a little bit of compensation and so on, but they don't get, let's say the, the inherent idea, like what is the point of being ironic when you can say the very same thing um, literally, what is the point of hiding your communication idea? What is the point of making it difficult for your interlocutors to get your get your idea? And I think this is the you know very profound and, and qualitative difference that differentiate like and generally generally speaking, people neurotypicals from people um uh, on uh, neurotypicals from people on the spectrum, and uh, that that's why I am um, curious. How do you let's say um, how does your account of uh, metacognitive account let's say, uh, relate to this um, more um, cognitive, different cognitive style way of uh, thinking about um, irony, um, or gener generally social functioning in, in, in autism. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's, it's, it's uh, uh, there is nothing I would disagree with in what you're saying. I don't, and, and, and this is what really happens. Uh, often participant, autistic participant, say that they don't really understand why, you know, why people do that. Even though they're taught, they know that, you know, neurotypicals do that. I think, however, an important step that could be entailed from, by what you say, and is, 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 to, is, is to have a social motivation account, basically, is to, to say they could understand irony, but they wouldn't because they, they don't, see it useful and they don't understand why you would do it. But the prediction would, would be, and it's a prediction that has been made actually by even by, um, by Kohari and Naira at the time, 
that if you put autistic people in a situation where they would be sufficiently motivated to perform certain pragmatic tasks, they would succeed at it. But what I think that emerges over and over is there are a certain class of pragmatic interpretation or interpretations that are really difficult for autistic individuals, inherently difficult. So these are different aspects of, of, of the same uh, phenomenon, but, but, but even though they don't understand why you would do this, it is, also, it is also difficult for whatever different reasons for them to do it, I think. Okay. So I don't think I, I, I mean, this is perfect timing because I think I've exhausted the list of uh, questioners from my chat. And I think Nicole also has no more questions on hers. We have to figure out how to make this more coordinated because <laughs> Nicole was getting questions, I was getting questions. Um, but if somebody had a question, I missed it. Here's, this is your moment. Uh, otherwise, um, I'll give you, uh, we'll, we'll count the five seconds. Um, I've called one, if that's okay. Okay. Sorry. You're, you're not junior. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> not junior. We're waiting for the most senior person. Go ahead, Nepal. I was just kidding. You have to do extra donation and two facial expressions for me. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks so much, uh, Mikhail. Uh, I think we, you know it's a very fresh, you know, perspective on all this. But I think we, we there's a lot of things we don't know empirically, but also conceptually. I think a lot of people are trying to understand what's going on and how to combine autism with theoretical pragmatics. And I think you're giving us suggestions for that. Um, and I also want to say just a big thank you to the people who asked questions, because I found a lot of these questions fascinating, exceptionally interesting. I just want to ask something, starting, of course, from your talk, but also a comment I think Diana made, and then something that Valentina added, and then something that Nicolas added. Okay, let me just say what I was thinking. You said we've got this range of strategies at our disposal from egocentric to allocentric, and maybe shades of these things. And um, I think you said, and other people said, you know, there could be constraints on what strategies an individual has access to, may, possibly from developmental stage, uh, from neurodiversity. So in certain patterns of cognition, you know, tissue cognition, you might have all of them or not have all of them. Valentina has in mind some conditions that maybe you don't actually have access to all of them. Um, and I just wanted to say, I want to add something and then hear your view. Um, isn't one of the factors that um, dictate whether you will access or activate one or the other strategy, uh, uh, the communicative situation itself. So you, 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 you've got, I, I think, you know, from work on reference and on perspective taking, I think there's a body of work showing that, you know, there, there are cues in the situation itself. For example, I think it's the Herb Clark's work Another to say, you know, if you're in the same room, physical co-presence, you know, line of sight, um, and a contemporaneity, you know, all sorts of other factors. You know, if all sorts of things are in place, you know, everything suggests you could be processing everything egocentrically and spending as little uh, resources as possible, and you know, engaging uh, the simplest strategies. Whereas, if as these conditions start to not be met, then this could be cues to start using the more costly. Uh, strategies. Uh, and it could be that the differences we see in autism uh, are because a lot of the, you know, it's are because of the, the difficulty with evaluating these cues, maybe one hypothesis. Basically, the strategies are there, but if you're not getting the cues from the situation that about which strategy you should be engaging, it could be taking you time to activate it. And maybe that explains why the autistic people in some of your studies were slow to latch on to the costly, special, advanced strategy. And then when they were latching onto it, they, they wouldn't let go, so to speak. And that kind of speaks maybe with what Nicolas was saying that, you know, you see a lot of problems in actual interaction in real time, but then when you're in the lab setting and you have time to understand the task and to crack what it gets at, 
you know, autistic people might perform as well as neurotypical. So it was a long question, sorry. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I guess I agree. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, situation, uh, uh, situational cues are important, but I don't think it's the whole story is saying, so, so again, I would agree if what you say doesn't mean that they have the whole range of available resources or strategy that, that could be used by a neurotypical person in the same situation, but they, don't ju they just don't perceive the right cues. I think the reasons for which you have difficulties in processing and noticing and taking into account relevant situational cues are exactly the same reasons for which you cannot as assess richer contextual information uh, perspective taking in running your interpretation. So as much as I think it's important not to over characterize or over um, emphasize pragmatic difficulties in autism, I also think it's really important not to go over the, the, the other side. And, and, um, uh, and uh, yeah, and with respect to standardized task, I think it's so, it's really important to remember that these tasks are proxies for what we think are pragmatic skills. And so it's really important to bear that in mind and be always careful in assessing how this proxy actually relates to the, to the actual process. And I think it's one of the problems in research on language in autism outside linguistics and pragmatics is that people just use standardized test and, and that's, th this is what gives the DSM characterization, which is really crude and well, it's not wrong, but it's not subtle either. So yeah, a false choice task or a parental questionnaire, it's not an indication of the pragmatic process. It's a, it's a proxy of pragmatic for pragmatic performance at best. Okay, I, th I think we'll, that will we'll close the, the session before I pass off uh, uh, to Nicole. I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here. It's really nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, occasionally I, I go around and I see people. I wish I could just say hi to all of you and uh, we'll have to do that offline. But let Nicole tell us about what's going to happen next. Yes, so thanks again, uh, Mikael, for this really interesting talk. And thanks for everyone for the thank great you, yes. session. Thank you very much for the question. I just want, sorry, I just want to say that the questions were really interesting and taught me a lot. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so we'll continue our travels to Europe. And uh, next month, we'll be visiting um, Petra Schumacher in Cologne. And she will tell us about uh, metonymy and Cabernet Sauvignon. So we're back on the wine theme. And uh, Petra also lives close to this um, company that developed the first vaccine actually. So maybe we can all get vaccinated and then do real conferences again soon. So um, thank you everyone for being here and we look forward to seeing you again next month. We'll make an announcement soon with the abstract and everything. Goodbye. <laughs>